Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Shabbat Shalom. It is Saturday, June 26th. We're studying Parsha Balak. This is part two. And um, having technical difficulties as usual, but we're just gonna forge on. And um, you could go to www.safeguardingtheeternal.wordpress.org, and then if you press the space bar, you can continue to search within Safeguarding the Eternal. And in there, you would put Balak, B-A-L-A-K, and the title of the lesson we're looking at is Parsha Balak, God's Communication Continues, Curses, Change to Blessings, and the easiest way would be just to... Um, You click on the link that I have put in the chat box. Let me do that right now. So we were continuing. We had just read some information we had from the book of uh, Second Peter, I believe. Second Peter, chapter two tells us a little more about Bill um and verse 15 what he's admonishing some people in this letter <clears throat> and he's saying these people have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Bill um Ben Peor who loved the wages of doing harm but was rebuked for his sin a dumb beast of burden spoke out with a human voice and restrained the prophet's insanity. Waterless springs they are, mist driven by a gust of wind. For them has been reserved the blackest darkness. We go back into the parsha, but me bar numbers twenty-two. We have verse fifteen through twenty. Balak kept sending officers more and higher ranking than these. They came to Balaam and said to him, So said Balak, son of Zippor, Do not refrain from going to me, for I shall honor you greatly, and everything that you say to me I shall do. So go now and curse this people for me. Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, If Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem, my God to do anything small or great. And now you too stay here for the night and I will know what more Hashem will speak with me. So you must have had big houses. You must have had like some kind of witch. If die, if he's asking one to spend the night. Okay. Yeah, since all my four. You know, it's kind of like that. So, Malachi's making the point that he's asking these emissaries um, to stay the night with him, so he must have money, he must have space to accommodate them, and I think he is, I think he's got a lot of wealth, I mean, you can see that he's after more and more wealth, and that can tend to happen when you already are very wealthy, right, so that's a good point, I haven't quite finished the passage, so, God came to Bil'am at night and said to him, if these men came to summon you, arise and go with them, but the only but only the thing I shall speak to you that shall you do. And then in Tehillim in Psalms one thirty nine twenty through twenty four, those who pronounce your name for wicked schemes, it is taken in vain by your enemies. For indeed those who hate you, O Hashem, I hate them. I quarrel with those who rise up against you. With the utmost hatred I hate them. They have be become my enemies unto me. Examine me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if I have a vexing way and lead me into the way of eternity. Revelation 2 from 12 through 14. 
to the angel. Okay, here's more information about Bil'am Malachi from the book of Revelation 2, 12 through 14. To the angel of the Messianic community in Pergamum, right? Here is the message from the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know that, I know where you are living. There where the adversary's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name. You did not deny trusting me even when at the time even at the time when my faithful witness Antipas was put to death in your town. There there where the adversary lives. Nevertheless I have a few things against you. You have some people who hold to the teaching of Bilam who taught Balak to set a trap for the people of Israel so that they would eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and commit sexual sin. Okay, so there we get the whole rest of the story. Balaam was the one who taught Balak how to trap the people of Israel and to send them off after the pagan gods of the Midianite women. You ask who Antipas is. That's in context that I do not know. I am not educated on, so I cannot answer that. Please, no, Antipas, please try to remember to raise your hand when you are going to ask a question. Please. I'm going to just make sure she um, got on here. Okay, at least got the right link. So let me see. Um, copy meaning me. I'm just going to send it off to her just in case she didn't get it. Um, send it to her and see if that works. And then there's one from David. Daniel. Sorry, you guys, just give me just a minute. I'm just trying to catch up with everything going on on this silly computer. May you do what, sweetie? You may get some water. All right, let me just double check. Thank you for your patience, video viewers and children of mine. Check one more time. Okay, that live the live's not going to work anymore. That's okay. So we go and down. We're going to read now Luke sixteen fifteen through eighteen. He said to them. You people make yourselves look righteous to others, but God knows your hearts. What people regard highly is an abomination before God. Up to the time of Yochanan or John, there were the Torah and the prophets. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed, and everyone is pushing to get in. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the Torah to become void. Every man who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and a man who marries a woman divorced by her husband commits adultery. Wow. You can't marry a, a divorced. Wow, wow, wow. This is so interesting. What do you think about this? Why does he say, talking about the Torah and the prophets and the kingdom of God and that it's easier for heaven or earth to pass away than for one letter in the Torah to become void. You know what void means, right? God. So, and then immediately he says anyone who divorces and marries another woman commits adultery. What does that have to do with the Torah? Well, that's in the Torah. And he's saying if that's in the Torah? Okay, good answer. But that's what happens in this part, right? 
They commit adultery. It doesn't say that those were married men doing that, but it could have been. I think it has something to do with the Torah being like the bride that you're betrothed to. The Torah, right, is something you espouse. You are supposed to intimately learn it, become close to it. It should be just because, you know, you can't marry a new woman without committing adultery. So I think it's an interesting idea that maybe... Um, Maybe it's a hint to how, how close we're supposed to keep the Torah and not to be divorcing the Torah from our lives. Right? What do you think about that idea? Mm-hmm. And people are doing that today. And we do that every time we transgress it or transgress God. All right, so go back on to the commentary and back to the thoughts of our Parsha Balak. Once again, we realize there is much that we do not see. The Lord, who knows the heart and sees all, becomes angered with Bil'am because he was going with the high-ranking men of Balak. God, didn't God tell him, go with them? What the Lord sees that we cannot simply read is that Bil'am goes without the intention of keeping a command of God or being a vessel for his use. From start to finish, Bil'am is aligned with the idea of cursing the children of Israel. He despises them and all the while longs for the chance to make a name for himself and be esteemed over them in the eyes of his peers. Bil'am goes with the evil intentions of Peers are those who are like around you, your friends or your co-workers or your others your, that are around you. you. Remember to raise your hand, though, please. It's helpful to me. Bil'am goes with the evil intentions toward God's kids in his heart foremost, and that is what angers God. Anti-Semitism and replacement theology stem from the spirit of pride and disobedience. The fuel for these terrible manifestations is fear, the fear of God's message, which is that he has the authority to choose. He chooses Israel in perpetuity. His paramount place is Jerusalem, and those who safeguard and sanctify his name are to have charge of his sovereignty there. In the name of my God, and in the name of religion, and in the name of everything holy, from ancient days to our current world presence, men have sought to divest and replace the chosen people from their appointed place, always pointing to the problem of Israel, in quotes. The hope I have is in knowing that God's communication with us is steadfast, and his message continues to be upheld and defended beyond persecution and death by his faithful. He tells us, through the evidence demonstrated by the richness of Israel, his eternal message, which is, he expects us to live lives of nobility. And that it is possible to bring the Shekhinah, the indwelling presence of the Lord, to the world. His people are forced for holiness and righteousness, and whatever opposition may arise, what he has planted shall not be uprooted, and for whom he has blessed, curse will emerge as blessing, and it shall not be altered by the ideas and doctrines of man. Hi, are you sleepy? Are you taking a nap? Want to take a nap? Want to go lay down? I love you. Okay, the next reading is Proverbs uh, chapter 1, verse 15. And 16. <clears throat> My child, do not walk on the way with them. Withhold your feet from their pathways, for their feet run to evil and they hasten to spill blood. Yeshayahu Isaiah 59, 7 and 8. Their feet run to evil and they rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of wickedness, plunder, and calamity are in their roads. They know not the path of peace and there is no justice in their circuits. They have made their paths crooked. 
All who walk them do not know peace. There is sheet 22, 1 through 3, and it happened after these things that God tested Avram and said to him, Avram. And he replied, Here I am. And he said, Hineni, yes. Hineni, here I am. Not just like, oh, I'm here at the table, but I am ready to do your will, right? Oh, maybe you guys should start saying that to me instead of, What? Yeah? From across the room. When I call your name, <laughs> he nanny, come come up to me, he nanny, ready to do what you're about to ask me to do. Go ahead. And he said, "Yes, please take your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah to bring him up there as an so specific, he's like, Bring your son, the one you love." And he's like taunting him, kind of. Not taunting him. He's not taunting him. He Not at all. God isn't taunting him. He knows how much he loves him, and that's why he's bringing it out. God doesn't like, taunt he us. Just said bring your eyes up, your son. He could, but he wants us to know that Isaac is the one that the promise is coming through. He's not his only son. He has um, Ishmael too. Yeah, Isaac, Isaac is the son of promise. Isaac is really his only legitimate son, I guess, in, in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, he is tenderly telling him, Look, I know this is your son, the one that you love. And I know this is going to be very hard for you, but this is what I'm asking you to do. Don't think of it as a mocking tone. It's not a mocking tone at all. But I know what you're saying. He is very specific, and the Torah being specific like that is meant to teach a lesson. So good for you for not ignoring it. Okay. So Avram woke up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. Avraham rose many times early in the morning, hastening to pursue and to be obedient to the will of the Lord, even to the point of offering his precious son. He wakes early and sets himself to this enormous task. We know the intentions of Bilam. Not only does his pride, this pride-filled man go out of the way to saddle his own donkey when he has two servants there to aid him, but he is up and at him in order to chase after the evil curses, he fully intends to attempt to deliver out over the children of Israel. The path of Balaam is a wicked one, totally contrary to the message of the Master, to the Torah, and to God. Shalomo Solomon expresses the directly opposite path as the evil path Isaiah speaks of, um, the path to life and peace. The path of the Torah of the King. And so, from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, and it goes to 5, and then 13, and then it goes to 21. So, my child, do not forget my Torah. And let your heart guard my commandments, for they add to you length of days and years of life and peace. Trust in Hashem in all, with all of your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know Him, and He will smooth your paths. Praiseworthy is a person who has found wisdom, a person who can derive understanding from it. For its commerce is better than the commerce of silver, and its produce is better than fine gold. It is more precious than pearls, and all your desires cannot compare to it. Length of days is at its right, at its left, wealth and honor. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its pathways are peace. It is a tree of life to those who grasp it, and its supporters are praiseworthy. My child, do not let them stray from your eyes. Safeguard the eternal Torah and its wise design. Very nice. So that's one of my favorite passages of scripture. And um, I love it because I do love the Torah with all my heart and its wise design. 
I'm gonna go on. I'm just gonna check a couple tabs really quick and see if anything's up and ready yet. So go. Mm -hmm. All right, we're still having camera issues on the live, so we'll just keep going. Um, the need to bar numbers 22, 21 through 27. Back to the parasha. Um, I hope that that book is teaching you a lot about the parasha today, Leora. I hope you're learning a lot about the parasha from that Holocaust novel. Yeah. Chapter 22, 21 through 27. Bil'am arose in the morning and saddled his she donkey and went with the officers of Moab. God's wrath flared because he was going, and an angel of Hashem stood on the road to impede him. He was riding on his she donkey, and his two young men were with him. The she donkey saw the angel of Hashem standing on the road with his sword drawn in his hand. So the she-donkey turned away from the road and went into the field. Then Bil Am struck the she-donkey to turn it back onto the road. The angel of Hashem stood in the path. I got it. I don't want you using this without me, okay? Because you guys used a lot of it, and there's expensive oils in there to just be spraying a ton of. The she-donkey saw the angel of Hashem standing on the, ro on the road with his sword drawn in his hand. So the she-donkey turned away from the road and went into the field. Then Bil'am struck the she-donkey to turn it back onto the road. The angel of Hashem stood in the path of the vineyards, a fence on his side and a fence on that side, on this side and a fence on that side. The she-donkey saw the angel of Hashem and pressed against the wall and it pressed Bilam's leg against the wall and he continued to strike it. The angel of Hashem went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn right or left. The she-donkey saw the angel of Hashem and crouched beneath Bilam. Bilam's anger flared and he struck the she-donkey with his staff. Mishle or Proverbs 4, 23-27 More than you guard anything, safeguard your heart, for from it are the sources of life. Remove from yourself distortion of the mouth and distance perversity of lips from yourself. Let your eyes look ahead and your eyelid direct your path. Weigh the course of your foot and all your ways will be established. Do not deviate to the right or left. Remove your foot from evil. Our groom will create every possible opportunity to change our courses if they be sinful and contrary to him for our own benefit. He courts us with his patient, loving hand and calls to us to just hear his voice and turn to it. The Lord uses a beast of burden in this case, and he first opens her eyes. She's able to see the dangers ahead and realizes the path they are on is wrong. She sees. Bil'am cannot see. How many times have we missed the messages the Lord has been sending to us? From the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, we are able to realize the extent to which God on high loves us and desires to communicate his program, his order, his message for life to us. Since Sinai, the communication of God with man has made a powerful sound. This sound never stops. He continues to speak to us and often in the strangest ways and most wondrous places. Can I have that, please? Excuse me, you are never to use that. That's dangerous to use and it's not yours. You are in trouble. You're in trouble for getting up without asking. You're in trouble for not listening and being respectful. You're in trouble for doing things like this. Super glue. This is what happens around here. Sure, come on over. I'll space some on you. Right. Oh, 
welcome. Oopsies. Hold on, please. I'm going to finish this paragraph. Through, okay, so he continues to speak to us and often in the most strange and wondrous places. Through people we never thought we would connect with or places we never dreamed we would find revelation. He continues to speak and send messages and we need to learn to become sensitized to hear them. Bill Am is representative of the person who is so desensitized to the idea of an all-knowing, all-powerful God who yet grants us, who yet grants us miracles, wonders, and favors in every season. He is the person who is continually met along the way with messages of the unchangeable and the voice of eternity every day and who argues, set on his own path, unwilling to even consider changing his established course. Spiritually blind, this person has set out on a path which encounter, which counters the undeniable supreme consistence of the word we were endowed with. <laughs> Thank you. And broken hedge clippers. Interesting. Interesting. In this place, on this path, when we begin to go the wrong way, it is here that we are crushed. If we find our... Do that somewhere else, buddy. We find ourselves in a place such as this, where there is nowhere to turn to the right or to the left. Look up. Return, repent, and see the grace of the Lord unfold. Are you playing that like a sofa? You're curly strong. Take it, don't bend it. Go ahead. Do -do 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 -do. Goofy boy. Isaiah 30, 19 through 21 reads, For the people dwelling in Zion and Jerusalem, you will not have to weep. He will surely show you grace at the sound of your outcry. When he hears, he will answer you. The Lord will give you meager bread and scant water. Your teacher will no longer be hidden behind his garment. And your eyes will behold your teacher. And your ears will listen. Even to the words spoken from behind you saying, This is the path. Walk in it. Whether you go to the right or to the left. This is the God I serve. Our king has compassion on his poor creatures and sends his angel to intercede. We later see the great irony in the words of Bilam we recognize here. Even the prophet, even the prophet who knows the mind of God, is what he said, can't see what the donkey sees. Bilam, who so casually reacts to the donkey speaking to him, fails to recognize that the Lord has caused nature to turn itself all around to turn him from this path of cursing the Jewish people. He is impervious to the forces God has used here to blind, to wake up calls. Here, here, sorry. And blind to the wake up calls the Lord is making. What wake up calls are we missing? Do we realize that the association of life events with words such as accident and coincidence completely remove God's dominion and authority from our lives? If we truly believe in him as a supreme, as supreme and have given him full charge of our days, we will realize that his hand is in every single thing. Life, death, light, darkness, curses and blessings. The hidden message here is that it's never too late to turn things around. I pray that we will not fight that, which we cannot clearly see, and not march headlong into the path of ignorance and indifference to the wondrous eternal messages God has placed all around us in his eternal word. Unveil our eyes, O Lord. 
Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. See, the word of God is alive. It is at work and is sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts right through to where the soul meets the spirit and joint meets marrow. And it is quick to judge the inner reflections and attitudes of the heart. Before God, nothing is hidden. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. Kathleen, Psalm 119, verse 10 through, 10, through 6, 10 through 18. With all my heart I sought you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. In my heart I stored your words so that I would not sin against you. Blessed are you, Hashem, teach me your statutes. With my lips I recounted all the ordinances of your mouth. I rejoiced over the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Of your precepts I will speak and I look at your paths. I occupy myself with your statutes. I will not forget your word. Bestow upon your servant that I should live that I might keep your word. Unveil my eyes that I may perceive wonders from your Torah. Let me 22, so back into the parasha. Verse 28 through 35. Bilam said to the she-donkey, Because you mocked me, if only there were a sword in my hand, I would not have killed you. The she-donkey said to Bilam, Am I not your she-donkey, that you have ridden upon me all your life until this day? Have I been accustomed to do such a thing to you? He said, No. Then Hashem uncovered Bilam's eyes, and he saw the angel of Hashem standing on the road with a sword drawn in his hand. He bowed his head, and prostrated himself on his face. The angel of Hashem said to him, For what reason did you strike your she-donkey these three times? Behold, I went out to impede, for you have hastened on the road opposite me. The she-donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. Had it not turned away from me, I would have now even have killed you and let it live. Balaam said to the angel of Hashem, I have sinned. For I did not know that you were standing opposite me on the road, and now, if it's evil in your eyes, I shall return. The angel of Hashem said to Bil'am, Go with the men, but only the word, that word, that I shall speak to you, that shall you speak. Only the word. So Bil'am went with the officers of Balak. Well, I thought he went home, and then they were like, what So he is home. Emissaries of Balak come to him. They try and get him to go. He says no. They go back to Balak. Then they come back. Balak says, I insist. And Balaam eventually goes with them. Now this is the path that he's on. He's trying to go in a certain direction. And um, No, Avinazari, you need to stop that. No, it was more like something else. You you may need to take him inside because I can't have that. If you want to put him in the car seat and just put him inside, he can take a nap. It's almost a nap time anyway. Um, did this cord get pulled out? Because it seems that it's not working. My computer's gonna die. Yeah, I had it plugged in, but it's not. Yeah, it can't be plugged in, so if we could check the connection points, it's just gonna die. Are you painting on my white tablecloth? Are you painting on my Shabbat brown tablecloth? Yep, yeah, you are. I can see paint. All over my brown Shabbat tablecloth. Why are you? Be why do you continue to paint with a paintbrush in your hand? You're not going to be painting on my cloth any more than you've already destroyed it, okay? No. So get it off the table, please. Put the paints away. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's a really cool plane. I I don't know if it was worth costing me my Shabbat tablecloth, though. That's my nice tablecloth. Are you listening to me? Okay. Satan. In the Hebrew, an opponent, mm. an arch enemy of good, an adversary. It can also mean to withstand. Yarat. <clears throat> to precipitate or hurl, to be rash, to be perverse, turn over. <coughs> it can also mean headlong. Derek is a road, journey, or pathway, figuratively a course of life or mode of action. The Hebrew text of this verse uses the words above. It seems to be evident that the adversary is present. Present in Bil'am and is fueling his hidden his hidden and is fueling his hidden precipitance, his passion to curse Israel. This is why the angel stands opposite him who is rushing headlong into this corrupted path, yet having set out to use Bil'am for some of the most amazing and prophetic messages. For Israel and the people of God with ears to hear, he grants Bill um, just enough ro rope to quote unquote hang himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? This parsha is what? A very interesting it's a very interesting parsha. What do you find interesting about the parsha today? That a donkey talks. That a donkey talks. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was not from the parasha he was saying, um, but it relates to the parasha, so she's saying it's interesting, some of the things are very interesting. That thing that you were saying, God is disgusted by the behaviors that went on in that land, and he's telling the people, you shouldn't do these disgusting things, that's why I kicked those people out. Later in the parasha, we see some of those things actually taking place. Uh, yeah, you can, you can go ahead. How is it? It's actually called Balak, which is about the king Balak, but it's more about Bil'am. Maybe it should be Parasha Bil'am, but for whatever reason, there's always a specific reason, it's entitled Parasha Balak. I yeah. guess he's the one kind of causing the activity here. It's not like the um, started it per se. But we've been in the desert. Mm -hmm. How did we get to this one? Okay, we've been in the desert. How did we get to this one? They actually all lead to each other. So the children of Israel have been wandering around. There's lots of things taking place here in the desert. The last couple of things, if you remember last week, they asked if they asked. Esau or Edom um, and Ammon that they could just walk through their land. Oh, yeah. Do you remember? And they said nope and not only that we're going to attack you. So what happened? Israel ended up completely winning over them. And now they're camped. And this is where our Parsha Balak takes place because they are now looking out at this people and they're hearing about this. They're like Moab and Midian are now specifically Midian is and Mo, no Moab King Balak of Moab. Now he's afraid. What if they come here and do that to us? What if they come and conquer us? Even though Israel weren't looking for trouble, were they? They were just let us just pass through. So that's kind of it. Does kind of fit in? It's not strange that we're here now. And now Balaam's about to go up 
and look out over this amazing camp. It's ordered. It's got the banners, and they're by the tribes, and in the center is this glorious Mishkan with God, the creator, the master of the universe, his presence there with them. So, it, for, for Balaam, Balaam the so that's what I was saying. I was trying to say in the blog was yes. So Leora is asking, was the angel there protecting Israel? The angel is trying to keep Balaam from going in that direction. Maybe it's a personal thing. I personally want you to change your heart towards Israel. Not necessarily protecting Israel from anything, because what are the curses of somebody? You can't curse what God has blessed. So I think maybe he was trying to teach us a lesson about going in the wrong direction, with the wrong attitude, with the wrong intentions. But I also think he was trying to maybe help Bilam to repent. Mm -hmm. You can grab a cup. You go on ahead. You can go on ahead. I think we're actually going to stop the recording here. And we'll go ahead and, and go pick back up in our parasha um, in our next section. So Shabbat Shalom.